Voice of America presents The Halls of Ivy, starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. Good evening, this is Ronald Coleman. And Benita Coleman. Inviting you to join us again on the campus of Ivy College. And now, The Halls of Ivy. Surround us here today, and we will not forget though we be far, far away. Welcome again to Ivy, Ivy College, that is, in the town of Ivy, USA. Somebody once observed that a letter is an unannounced visitor, and a postman is thus the agent of impolite surprises. Well, it looks as though Dr. William Todder Hall is going to have a lot of epistolary company this morning. When his wife, Victoria, brings an armful of letters into his study and says... Darling, I know how busy you are this morning, so I've already sorted the mail. I took out all the ones addressed to Mr. and Mrs., and here's your batch. The batch. Vicky, my sweet, I would hardly describe two as a batch. <laughs> a batch is a, a quantity or a number of anything coming at one time and treated as a set. A set? Oh, I see, like a batch of tennis, so I just had my hair batched. <laughs> or a batching hen. <laughs> well, for your, for your information, uh, which you may find useful on rainy afternoons, mm. the origin of the word batch is the Anglo-Saxon bacon to bake. Oh, I always thought bacon was what you brought home from a horse race if you were lucky. <laughs> no, dear, that is B-A-C-O-N. Oh. Uh, which brings up another interesting word association. The use of various edibles for the word money. Well, there's cabbage, lettuce, dough, beans, sugar, berries, grains. <laughs> then you can have fish. Lend me ten fish until payday. Mm-hmm. Or just part of a fish. Lend me a fin. <laughs> Or just a buck, which is a male deer, which is meat, which takes care of the whole subject, of which I was getting a little weary anyway. It's hardly worth the time we spent on it. <laughs> We're getting back. Uh, is there anything interesting in your batch of letters? Nothing except there probably won't be a bachelor left in this college the day after graduation. These are all invitations to weddings. Ah, yes. June plus graduation equals marriage. A mathematical equation which sometimes makes me feel that despite my concern with administrative and academic problems, I am, in the final analysis, simply a marriage broker. (laughs) Business is flourishing and everyone is going to live happily ever after. Well, some people have scornfully referred to colleges as matrimonial bureaus. But don't stop, darling. Louise will get it. Oh, to be sure, it is not the purpose of an educational institution to provide mates and helpmates uh, for its inmates. But, um, but since marriage, as I can fervently testify, is the desideratum, the summum bonum, well, then sir. I can... Hello, Mr. Well, hello, oh, hello Grogan. Grogan. Hey, are you folks busy? No busier than usual at this time of year. Yeah, this time of year. I'd like to rewrite the calendar, leaving out June entirely. <laughs> Why, what's the matter with the joyous month of June? Who enjoys it? Maybe you and your bride, not me. <laughs> Well, is this a general mood of depression, Grogan, or something particular? I'm up to my neck in particulars. Well, come on. Don't just stand there. Give us a particular. House mothers. What? Oh, all of a sudden they love me. They can't live without me. How can you hold a dance without Grogan? And all on the same night in 17 different places. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tribute to your ability as an officer of the law and your graceful presence as a gentleman, Grogan. It's ruining my digestion, that's what it is. Seventeen different kinds of cake in one night. <laughs> yeah, but I didn't come over here to talk about myself, Doc. I got another beef. You have a beef? I just used the word in what you might call a slang way. Colloquial. Idiomatic. That's right, idiomatic. <laughs> and if that idiot, excuse me, idiot is no way for me to talk about a professor, even if he is, which he is, <laughs> Look, Doc, uh, you, know, I, you know I got nothing against education. Oh, on the contrary, Grogan, you have viewed our educational activities with considerable tolerance. Yeah, and you've been very nice to the students, even in their more irrational moments, too, when they're being what we might call non-campus mentis. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I'm glad to do it, whatever it is. Anyway, if I may be permitted to say so, and who's going to stop me? Some of your teachers need an education in the facts of life. Oh, we all do, Grogan. Teachers are human beings doing their best to teach other beings the human values. As H.G. Wells said in his undying fire, teaching is the greatest of all tasks. It is to ensure that man, man the divine, grows in the souls of men. An untaught man is but himself alone, as lonely in his ends and destiny as any beast. A man instructed is a man enlarged from that narrow prison of self into participation in an undying life that began we know not when that grows above and beyond the greatest of the stars. Well, that's what H.G. Wells said about teachers. Well, I ain't no H.G. Wells, and I don't make no broad statements. (laughs) I don't say all teachers is inhuman. I just got one of them in mind. (laughs) Him and his corny jokes. Jokes, did I say? May heaven strike this laughter from me lips. <laughs> well, would you would you care to be more specific in your... He doesn't uh... have to be more specific for me, William. I'm sure he means Professor Heaslip. None other than the same. Well, now, Professor Heaslip has certain uh, mannerisms we all do. But, Grogan, I must assure you that the head of our English department is thoroughly competent. Competent in the head, maybe. But no compassion in the heart. He won't even give a girl a break. For what girl? Well, maybe you don't know, but it's Caroline Swanson. Lives off the campus in a boarding house. Now, folks, you know I ain't sentimental. Oh, of I'm... course not. Heart of stone, Grogan. We're oh, completely <laughs> unemotional. Except with dogs, children, and the first eight bars of Mother McCree. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, that poor kid. Husband is overseas in the army. Her working part time and the studying and the worrying... Just trying to keep her head above water. And this professor throws her an anvil. <laughs> now, I, now, I'm sure that whatever Professor Heaslip has done has been only in the performance of his duty. It's his duty to sanity examination papers. Why, what, what's the matter with her, Grogan? Is she ill? Not exactly, but the doctor told her she had to stay in bed. And Heaslip said it was too bad, but he couldn't make no exceptions. And she would have to come to class to take the exam or else. Well, if she's under a doctor's care, that is certainly an extenuating circumstance. However, it is not unusual at this particular time of the year for students to develop strange symptoms. Blue book allergy. Compound fracture of the thesis. (laughs) Inflammation of the curriculum. (laughs) Oh, she ain't really sick. She's going to have a baby. (laughs) Oh, a baby. Oh, and with her husband overseas, and she's here all alone. Oh, well, a baby. Is it very... I mean, uh, uh, is this child... Uh, well, well, how imminent is the... Uh, is it... <laughs> it ain't imminent at all. It's going to be almost any minute. <laughs> and, uh, and Professor Heaslip is being unsympathetic. Hmm. I imagine Professor Heaslip must have been so involved in trends of 18th century prose that he was unable to recognize an act of God when he heard about it. But thank you for bringing this to my attention, Grogan. Well, that's why I come here. It ain't exactly in my department, but I figured that you'd know what to do about it. So now, it's your baby. So long, folks. Hi, Grogan. Almost the first thing you notice about our Mr. Grogan is that he isn't sentimental. No, no, he isn't. He cries at card tricks. <laughs> Do you ever watch him after graduation when the students start making their round of farewells? He suddenly develops a terrible head cold. Yeah, I know. The kind that makes your eyes water. <laughs> but, darling, now we've got to get in touch with Caroline Swanson right away. Yes, she must be Donald Swanson's wife. He was graduated last year, and I did hear that he'd gone into the army. Appropriately enough, into the, uh, <laughs> the infantry. <laughs> yes, I know who she is now. She's a very pretty girl. Works part-time in the campus niche shop. Very foresighted of her. I hope she gets a discount. <laughs> uh, Vicky, I suppose it would be pointless to try to explain this kind of human problem to Professor Heaslip. Oh, yes. He probably thinks a bassinet is some kind of medieval musical instrument. <laughs> 
And a crib, something his students are doing behind his back. <laughs> well, I shall take the matter into my own hands. Oh, good for you. Go right over Heaslip's head. No, I shall not go over his head, Vicky. I shall meet him head on. I shall call upon him, collect the questions, and supervise the conduct of the examination in person. Oh, darling, I love you when you get that determined look on your face. <laughs> and you don't mind my quoting your own games, Russell Lowell. All the beautiful sentiments in the world weigh less than a single lovely action. Yay! And it's awfully nice of you to want us for Saturday night, Mrs. Merriweather, but Dr. Holt's been out all afternoon, so I'll have to call you later after I've spoken to him. You say, yes, goodbye. She says half past five. Well, I better tell Louisa dinner be a bit late. I wonder what's keeping the. Hello? Hello, Vicky? Oh, were you trying to get me, darling? Uh, yes, I was I... just talking to Mrs. Merriweather. They've invited us for dinner on Saturday yeah, night. No, Vicky. But I told her I'd have to ask if we had anything on, you yeah, see. Vicky, and then she I haven't said any time now. after that. Vicky! I... Well, what's the matter, darling? Uh, Caroline Swanson. Oh, yeah, of course, the examination. How's it going? No, no, she's going. Vicky, she's going to have the baby. Yes, I know that. Yeah. Oh, what now? Yes, yes, dear. Right, right now. I, I'm taking her to the general hospital. If anyone calls, refer them to the maternity ward. Well, they'll probably think the ambulance picked up the wrong member of the family, but I'll tell them. <laughs> no, no, no. J just explain that I am acting in loco parentis. That's a Latin term, meaning that with the father absent, someone else has to go crazy. <laughs> is bringing you this presentation of The Halls of Ivy, starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. And now to return to The Halls of Ivy. It's later that evening, and we find Mrs. Hall just entering the Ivy General Hospital in search of Dr. Hall. Dr. Tyndall, Dr. Tyndall, you're wanted in surgery. Dr. Tyndall, report to surgery. Excuse me, nurse, but could you tell me where I might find Mrs. Donald Swanson? Mrs. Swanson? Mm -hmm. uh, just a moment, please. Oh, yes, yes, that's a maternity case, third floor. But you can't see her now. I think Mr. Swanson's in the father's waiting room now. <laughs> Mr. Swanson, but that's impossible. He's in Korea, and I... Oh, oh, yeah, that, Mr. Swanson, yes. <laughs> Thank you, nurse. <laughs> Could you tell me, where is the waiting room for maternity cases? Right down the hall and to your left. Who are you waiting for? Mrs. Donald Swanson. Oh, yes. Well, it'll be some time yet. You're a relative? Yes. Well, uh, but that is... Well, uh, I think I saw Mr. Swanson in the waiting room a few moments ago. Yes, yes, of course. Well, thank you very much, nurse. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Swanson, I presume. Oh, darling, I'm so glad you... <laughs> Mr. Swanson. <laughs> it seems that in the confusion, nobody's been told that the father is overseas, so the nurses think that you're Mr. Swanson. <laughs> Good heavens, they do. <laughs> I'm supposed to be a relative, too. They're very strict about visitors. Well, I'm relieved that you're here, my sweet. This is quite a, a nervous business. After a life neatly regulated by the clock and classroom bells and undeviating schedules, this, this uncertainty is is, wouldn't you think that nature, being a mother herself, would arrange these things with a little more efficiency? <laughs> well, I, what do the nurses say? Have you asked them? No, dear, I haven't. For some unaccountable reason, I'm afraid to ask them the simplest questions. <laughs> I shouldn't say unaccountable either. It's just that all nurses treat the rest of us as congenital idiots. Oh, yes. <laughs> I know. You say, um, what day is it, nurse? And they say, now, now, we are not going anywhere, dear. <laughs> I think it's their use of the editorial we that intimidates me. Shall we have our bath now? <laughs> Well, look what we have for our dinner. 
<laughs> Some lovely mashed turnips and skimmed milk. <laughs> we must get a good sleep because we are having our basal metabolism in the morning. <laughs> yes, it's that we. <laughs> Gives the impression of speaking for a powerful and sinister organization. Uh, <laughs> and the terrifying abbreviations. Have you ever heard them talking amongst themselves? One nurse will say to another, Did 323 have a DKJ? <laughs> yes, but it was NSG, so they're doing a PDQ first thing in the AM. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is, if his COD can bear up under the A of Yes. Well, then they... Then they pat their little starched caps, swish their little starched skirts, and take their little starched conversation down the hall. <laughs> well, starch or no starch, they're mighty handy to have around. Yes. Let me go ask them how Caroline's doing. Oh, I've already asked them that. And I've already had the answer, an exasperating ambiguity. She's doing fine, just fine. <laughs> but, Vicky, hasn't she been doing fine for an awfully long time now? I mean, I've been here since six o'clock. Now, Toddy, and... now, relax. As if you hadn't got enough on your mind, all the preparations for graduation, and <laughs> here you are, standing in for an absentee father when you should be home, writing a speech about education for the future. Well, in, in a way, I'm doing what you might call field work on that subject. <laughs> Why, well, I've already held up five expectant fathers, and, and just between ourselves, Vicky, it's not as easy as passing out diplomas. As a matter of fact, one of them passed out in my arms. <laughs> one of the diplomas? Yeah, no, no, I, I, guess I, I guess I'm not making much sense. But, Vicky, do you realize that we might sit here for months, perhaps years, behind an antiseptic iron curtain, Forever speculating on what really goes on in the minds of these angels of mercy. Oh, now, darling, there's a good reason for the way nurses act. The less they tell you, the less there is for you to worry about. Yes, I suppose so. But you know, Vicky, this has given me an idea for the curriculum of our medical school. Using as text a book called uh, The Stock, Symbol of Fatherhood. <laughs> what a clumsy bird, the stock, with no sense of timing. Long legs to facilitate floor pacing. Red eyes denoting sleepless nights. <laughs> a long neck for stretching around hospital corridors. <laughs> and a big bill for services rendered. <laughs> yes, the, the book would also into... Ah, Grogan, come in. Glad to see you. Well, come and join the reception line. Well, you'd think somebody would have told me. How is it going? Well, that, Grogan, is my own unrequited question. I've been reduced to mute expectancy and silent patience. I know, I know. Listen, Doc, I was one of 14 kids. The fifth, I think. No, no, the fourth. So I helped my pop wait up for ten of them. And when we was waiting for me, Brother Aloysius, Pop and me slipped out to the ballpark, seen a doubleheader, and got back with half an hour to spare. That's why Aloysius was always my favorite brother. He was so considerate to be get born in the daytime. <laughs> Dr. Shulman, you're wanted in maternity. Dr. Shulman, this is an emergency. Well, I wonder if that's Caroline's Dr. William. Shulman? No, I don't think so. She called her Dr. Carter, I believe. Oh, Dr. Carter? I just went into him in the drugstore at the corner having a sandwich. Oh, so you got plenty of time to kill. <laughs> hey, how's about me scaring up a deck of cars? Maybe we could play a little auction pinochle. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm not familiar with the game, Grogan. I learned it from the stagehands myself. Every, even now I can't play it unless I'm sitting in a draft with the orchestra tuning up. <laughs> well, how's about some penny ante poker? No, no, poker's a little out of my line, too. I play it so badly that even with aces wired and sitting under the gun with a case ace in the discard... That's enough, Doc. That's enough. <laughs> Teaching somebody to play poker that talks like that, I might just as well hand you my paycheck. <laughs> no, sir, I'm no pigeon. You're very smart of you, Grogan. Dr. Hall plays poker like a riverboat gambler. <laughs> you would be a pigeon to take him on. Pigeon? You know, I've always been interested in how that stout-bodied, self-assured bird, well able to take care of itself was chosen as the symbol for one who is victimized. Now you take the powder pigeon, a variety which I've all... You can see why the meadowlark, one of the most common of all birds, is also one of the most popular. 
And then, of course, Grogan, there is the celebrated Nightingale. You remember Keats's ode? Thy plaintive anthem fades past the near meadows, over the still stream, up the hillside. And now it is buried deep in the next valley glades. Was it a vision or a waking dream? Fled is that music. I beg your pardon. Do I wake or sleep? You really have to be more quiet. Oh, This oh. is a hospital, you know. Oh. And there are patients sleeping. Oh, of course. I, I'm sorry, nurse. I, I didn't realize. I... Yes. Well, just so you keep your voices down, please. Yes. <laughs> she has probably had a very unhappy love life. <laughs> Don't pay no attention to that hatchet puss. <laughs> she, she was right, Grogan. Was I really shouting, Vicky? Oh, no, Toddy. You were just a little carried away by Keats. But it was lovely. Yeah, sure, pretty, Doc. I'm a city kid myself. I don't know nothing about boys. <laughs> uh, except I used to get them all the time. Uh, <laughs> only boys' nest I ever seen was in my sister's hats. <laughs> But how in the world did I get started on the subject of bird life? Well, it was a triple play, darling. Pinochle to poker to pigeon. Ah, yes. Well, <laughs> under the circumstances, I think we'd better try patience. Yet can I not of such tame patience boast as to be hushed and not at all to Excuse say... Me. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, nurse. Was I talking too loudly again? Oh, no, not at all. As a matter of fact, you can shout if you want now. Congratulations. It's a boy, Mr. Swanson. An eight-pound boy. <laughs> Yes, darling, I've been revising my address for graduation. It seems that my experience of last night has led me to invest more vitality and hope into the subject of facing the future. But, uh, uh, Vicky, you went to the hospital this morning. Were you able to see Caroline? Yes, darling, and she's fine. And the baby is such a little dolly. It's blue-eyed and bald as a knee. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, she's naming him Donald Todd Hunter Swanson. Todd Hunter? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, well, that, that wasn't necessary at all. No, I, I don't think she should have done that. After all, I did she really? <laughs> it's very interesting. Well, darling, she's terribly grateful to you, and she's such a sweet girl, you know. Excuse I... me, darling. Uh, Dr. Hall speaking. Oh, hello, Professor Heaslip. How did it go? Oh, splendid. Seven pounds, 14 ounces, a boy. Oh, oh, you mean the examination. Well... <laughs> Well, well, I have postponed it. The exact date will depend upon the availabi uh, availability of a babysitter. Uh, incidentally, Professor, how's your schedule? Uh, yes, yes, well, well, I'll be in touch with you, Professor. Goodbye. What did he say? Uh, he said, with characteristic originality, that circumstances alter cases, and considering the merits of this case, the quality of mercy is not strained. And he finished up with the eloquent observation that now is the time for all good men to come to the aid of the party. <laughs> Professor Heeslip said that. Oh, Toddy, he's slipping. He sli he slipped. Oh, Vicky, Vicky. Oh, 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 oh. After all I've been through. Well, be brave, darling. <laughs> anyway, Toddy, you were a dear to stand by when Caroline was having her baby. This is not the regular duty of a college president, you know. I know, my darling, but time was of the essence. Besides, the idea of this young mother, alone here at Ivy with no one else at hand. Oh, of course, she was prepared to go it alone without asking for help. But after all, when one's sympathy is enlisted and not drafted, the enlistment must be served. We'll be seeing you next week at this same time at the Halls of Ivy starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. Grogan is played by James Gleason, and the nurses were Janet Warren and Jean Tatum. Tonight's script was written by Barbara and Milton Merlin and Don Quinn. Oh, we love the halls of Ivy that surround us here today. This production of the Halls of Ivy was broadcast with an actual audience present in the studio. Thank you.